Scott has joined us. So I just want to welcome everybody uh, to the summer seminar series. We do this every year, you guys know. Uh, you know, we do fun little talks, kind of what's going on in your life, um, what's going on in your world. And I know everybody's world is a little different right now. Um, so I just want to welcome everybody, remind everybody, keep your mic muted while our talker gives his presentation. And uh, without further ado, I think I'll turn it over to Scott if we're ready. Great. All right. Great. So good morning or good afternoon, I guess now, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining our first summer series. And look forward to talking to you today about some of the things I've been working on the last several years with Harry Lynch, who produces and directs the films that we make, and uh, a lot of you and, and folks over at the Switch Energy Alliance and others around the world. So it's been interesting. I'll, I'll start with this quote, and it, I'm not much of a philosopher, but this is one I like. It's the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. And I think that's so important globally that we are able to entertain thoughts now, but we don't have to accept them, but at least have the, the civil platform to talk about things that are difficult. And energy can get that way, so can poverty. Today, I'm going to really focus on the, the poverty side of things, but as you all know, I study and have for many years energy, the economy, and the environment, how those things overlap. And some of the main environmental issues are four big pillars to me, land, the water, the air, and the atmosphere, all four uh, very important components of environmental stewardship. Poverty, uh, competition growth on the economic side, and then fossil, nuclear, and renewable energy. I broke them out that way. You could do energy in lots of different ways. But this is complicated stuff. You know, there are social, legal, political systems, and we see it all the time. I don't care what you read or listen to or have streamed to you. Uh, you're going to hear topics that right in the heart of all these uh, different sectors. Very interactive, and that's why it makes it complicated. If it were simple, it would be easier. If it were, if, 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 the, if there was just black and white. Uh, it's presented that way often, kind of good and bad, clean and dirty. Black and white, it's not. Those are false choices in, these, in this sector. Uh, I call it the radical middle. It's challenging in there. You know, you got to look at data and you got to compromise, be willing to be wrong, uh, which I am often. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, that's where the action is. In that overlap space, if you're truly incorporating the different aspects of these, it's, it's where the action is. Big problems, big challenges. And the Bureau works a lot in this space takes critical thinking, looking at the pros and cons, multiple sides of all these issues to, to do this well. I just color coded these by political party, you know, I, not really, but you know, the left thinks they own the environment and renewables and the right are all about the economy and fossil and nuclear energy, whatever. You know, this is such a, a false portrayal of the realities of these things, um, but it's how sometimes we even ourselves are <laughs> find ourselves believing some of this the false political dichotomy that goes on here. Um, so we'll look at the economy. You know, poverty is where I want to focus today, mostly on the economy. And what does it look like? This is this graph looks at severe poverty across the bottom, the x-axis, incomes less than three dollars and ten cents a day, against how electrified is the country. So if we look at Latin America and the size of the circle is proportional to population, with Brazil the largest in Latin America. The countries are mostly electrified, and then that kind of 10 to 30 percent severe poverty range. Three dollars a day, by the way, is, 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 is way below the poverty line in the United States, just for reference. You know, you're looking at thousand dollars a month, um, so very low. Uh, you go to Asia, a lot more people, less electrification, more severe poverty, and then Africa, uh, another billion people, uh, less electrification by a lot and more poverty. And Kenya and Ethiopia are highlighted there, Vietnam. These are places we filmed and switch on if you've had a chance to see the film yet. So it's not correlation causation, but there's certainly a strong relationship between access to electricity and coming from poverty. It does lead to a paradox or a dilemma. Energy won't end poverty, but you can't end poverty without energy. And all the things that come along with lifting yourselves from poverty. How pervasive, look, uh, a billion people in the world today don't have electricity still. And that's a good trend. You know, 
know, it's down from over a billion and a half, not that long ago, two couple decades ago. Great trend. And, and what's a billion though? Here's a map of the world's population, color coded. It's rough, but about a billion people per color. We're not evenly distributed. You know, you're, all of the Western hemisphere is about a billion people, okay? A billion people without electricity in the world today. Now, another major form that we featured in Switch On is, is clean cooking or access to clean cooking fuels. You, you might recognize Sanakanchi here. I took this picture and, and uh, how many people cook like that? A third of the world? Over two, two and a half billion people still cooking with fuels that are uh, devastating to health, as we showed in the film. Just indoor smoke alone, uh, cataracts, uh, lung cancer, uh, pneumonia, and other lung diseases in the kids. It's, it's awful. You know? You're killing three million people every year just from this. It's, that's more than malaria and AIDS. And then, and, and so, uh, where do we live? You know, people, uh, where do we live? And this map shows density of population in the world. There are some large white areas with very few people. There are people living here to be sure, but not many. And there are reasons why. You can kind of see for yourself some of the larger areas there. So those gray areas are highlighted. We can't really calculate income in those areas where there aren't many people. But where there are people, we can start to see that $1,000 a year or less. Um, you know, this is severe poverty. I said, I said $3 was 1000 a month. It's 1000 a year. Um, and then ten dollars uh, $10 a month, or four thousand dollars a year, plus or minus. This is very severe poverty, and again, it's way below U.S. poverty levels. And about let's call lower and middle income. Uh, that's all over the world, but it's particularly concentrated in the areas that I've put these ovals around. Lots of poverty in and around these equatorial belts. We made the film switch on. We went to five countries and three continents and featured different kinds of energy challenges there. I put stars on those. And let's just step through that. For some who haven't had a chance, we went down to Colombia, the Iwako village of Munchukwa. Uh, they invited us to come living the way they have for 500 years and some, some pretty interesting and positive aspects to this as well. But mud huts and thatch roofs, uh, young kids going to school on mules. We didn't hand him a machete. He carries a machete. Uh, we use it for various things. Here they are, uh, self-guided on the way in from agrarian from the mountains to school. This is my kid. He helped design this whole mission. Uh, we put in just a three and a half kilowatt solar array to power seven mud huts and thatch roofs with lighting, ceiling fans in the community center, and one refrigerator freezer over the course of eight days. We'll have a detailed episode on this. There are a lot more challenges than we were able to show in the film itself. But here's the beautiful village of Conchuqua, and you can see the solar array down here in the lower left. And then in the right is the pole we put up during the visit. And at the, at the end, we turned on a 50 watt LED light bulb to light up the community center. And there they are for the first time seeing one another at night in their own village, other than over a fire. Bill Hayes and Sarah Jane are not giants. Bill's about my height, you know, just under six feet, but they look huge. That's one of the challenges of, of uh, health, you know, not much health care, uh, food that's quite different, uh, not nearly as nutritional, et cetera. They don't grow as big as we do. Here we are in the center, the community center at night, still, you know, dirt floors, but ceiling fans that are turning in remarkable faces, and that's our team. It took uh, a bunch of us uh, eight days and a year of planning and $100,000, including the filming, to bring a three and a half kilowatt array. That's half of what you'd put on one home in Austin. Okay, It's not cheap to get out here where there's not much access. And there I am with the Mama or one of the village uh, chiefs or leaders. That's distributed renewables. In Ethiopia, we looked at a whole different scale. Again, mud huts and thatch roofs, a little different design, but quite interesting how common some of these designs are. And the kids there, again, uh, spent time there. They're remarkably friendly and, and happy in their own way, but, but huge challenges. I don't know if you can see on the legs a lot of open wounds and things, just uh, clothes that haven't 
been changed for a very long time. This is deep, severe poverty. The solution there is different. They're building one of the world's largest dams. This is, this is called the GUR, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. We flew in with an overflight. I took this out of the window. Uh, it's like three times the size of our Hoover Dam. When it's going to be completed, it's getting close. It's on the Blue Nile, flows north to merge with the White Nile into the main Nile and into eventually into Egypt and Cairo. A lot of disruption of the North Africa politics as a result of this. I mean, a fascinating story, which we'll detail in, the, in, in our uh, episodes later. Giant thing, here's the US Statue of Liberty. I'll put her to scale. So you can see this is, these are, this is a massive facility. Looking across, it's about a mile across. Uh, 16 major turbines, 400 megawatt turbines, 6.4 uh, gigawatts of capacity. When it's filled, that's six nuclear reactors, 10 coal plants. It's about 10,000 two megawatt wind turbines with a capacity factor of reasonable capacity factor, 10,000 turbines. So this is approaching the amount of wind in Texas, okay, in one facility. And, and where will it go? Well, there's a power pole in the village, but it doesn't have any wires on it yet, but it will bring electricity. And there's a school. These are people that have been displaced from upriver. And the kids are going to the school for the first time. I asked them, what grade are you in? And they all said the second grade because they'd never been in school. Regardless of age, they started in the second grade. And wonderful, uh, again, wonderful visits. So this is a rural centralized grid, and it will also feed urban It'll power about half of Ethiopia's demand today, plus sell electricity in neighboring countries and bring revenue to Ethiopia. It's a game changer. Okay. Different way to address energy poverty. And it's clean in terms of emissions. Uh, you might not think dams are clean yourself. I struggle with them in some level, you know, disrupting the land and people and the hat, the fish and the soil and all sorts of environmental impacts of major hydro facilities, but there are no emissions from them. Go over to Nepal, you see Sana Kanchi and her five children. Uh, one has a kid, Sana Kanchi's 36, and has five kids cooking indoor her whole life with wood. And we, we have a wonderful guide who's actually at Berkeley, uh, but he spent the time with us in the country for a week. Visit a local hospital where a lot of these kids and moms come with various diseases related to purely to smoking, uh, smoke inside. It is like smoking a couple packs of cigarettes a day for these kids and these, and these mothers mostly. So LNG, LPG is a wonderful option for them. It comes, the gas comes from India, but atmosphere, you know, the air, you cook with natural gas like we do in our homes, there aren't any emissions, there's CO2, uh, but smaller levels. And, and just a remarkable instant impact. You can deliver it locally. Uh, it's more affordable. They have to actually pay for the wood they burn inside because they're not allowed to harvest anymore because of deforestation. Just a lot of environmental impacts from using biomass or energy. I know Europe counts biomass as green. They make electricity with biomass in Europe and call it green somehow, because somehow the trees pull out more CO2 than they put out or something. But you know that ignores everything in between to harvest the trees, make it into wood pellets, move it on trains and ships, move it back, um, blah, blah, blah. It's not a zero emissions game. Uh, by any means. So this is a good source and, uh, and then electric cooktops. Here's, here's a home with the old heating. It's still ceremonial there from wood. And then you got your LPG tank behind and then there's your biogas coming in. <clears throat> so not LPG, but actually creating biogas from the livestock and human wastes. And this one even had an induction cooktop, a single burner induction cooktop from electricity. There inside this home was remarkably different from the one not that far away. Centralized and distributed clean cooking. And finally in Kenya, I won't talk about Vietnam today, but in Kenya, a whole different challenge in the large, one of the largest, if not the largest slum in Africa, Kibra. Over a million people live here. Severe poverty, it's hard to describe it really, but they have churches and schools. Kenya Power brought in electricity. I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you this story. I'm going to show you a video here. I'm not going to talk about it now, but here I am in front of one of the schools that now has light bulbs, two light bulbs hanging inside of it with kids looking at an image of themselves. Um, so that's an urban centralized grid with lots of challenges. So we've been making these 
episodes because you can't show everything in a 79 minute film. So we have seven episodes we've created. They're almost finished that dive deeper into the story. This one I wanna show you, it's rough cut. The color correction hasn't happened, the sound design, working on the voiceover. It's not my voice that's reading it, it's Harry's at this point in time. A lot of challenges, so this is not final. You're gonna to get to see something no one else has seen yet except our little team. But these will be posted on our internet, on the Switch site soon. I wanna take you deep into the story in Kibra. Even if you've watched Switch on, you might get a little bit different feel for what this is all about. So I'll let you watch this. So there you have a little bit different look than the film was able to show. And it's uh, pretty interesting, isn't it? And that's not unique. So lots of different perspectives and things in play and energy always. And you can see that uh, when we kind of flesh that out. That rough cut will be finished up with, along with six other episodes where we dive deep into coal in Vietnam and distributed renewables, uh, both in Nepal and Colombia and other things. So. Those will be on the switchon.org website within a month. It takes a lot to produce an episode like that, a lot. So let me kind of wrap a couple things up and open up the questions. Um, so now if I add wealth, we saw where big regions in the ovals here were where the poverty exists. But if you go to four to 12,000 a year or more than 12,000 a year, that's a thousand bucks a month or more. In the blue, that's called high income. Those areas are focused and limited really to key parts of the world. There's blue in all the world, there are wealthy people to be sure. But extensive wealth is in the blue areas. Interesting how it kind of falls in and outside of some key geographies, 20 north and 20 south. In fact, if you look at the annual mean temperature of the earth today, you can see where the, a lot of people don't live again, that's those areas where it's very hot or very cold. But where do we live? We live where it's just right temperature wise, right in that nice, band, you know, the Goldilocks band. Not too hot, not too cold. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of the poverty exists where it's very warm today, 20, 25 degrees C and more. And so we talk about adding one, two, three, four degrees C, and certainly there's a warning concern that that will hurt the world's poor. Uh, you add five, ten percent more heat. One of the challenges, of course, in those areas is they don't have the kinds of things that we have with energy, as you just saw in Kibra. So here's a map of the world at night. It's a composite Landsat of the lights at night. And again, not evenly distributed. Wealth exists where the lights are on. That correlation is real. Um, and you can see when you look at all the countries in the world, nocturnal luminosity, lights at night against GDP per capita, it's not perfect fit but there's a strong correlation there. And, and where it's poor, not that many lights. To be sure, lights on the coast, parts of Brazil, India has a grid everywhere, but not a lot of people cannot afford it. So it's interesting that, that electricity, particularly, but all energy will help the world's poor, like it helps the world's rich. You know, when we have air conditioning here in Texas now, It'd be tough in the summer and the heating in northern latitudes in Sweden and other places that allows us to live lives year round because of access to energy. We control our climate. So this, this little waltz, this energy in the economy waltz, I didn't talk about it today, but there's plenty of data that show the relationship. I showed some slides on that strong tie. And healthy economies do what? They invest in the environment. In fact, I've been in 65 countries, and, and the worst environments, almost without exception, are where it's poor. This is Kibra, but looking at a different view, kids coming home from school, I took this picture, walking over mounds of polluted water and garbage, and the local air is bad, the soils are polluted. If I go back and look at this smoke that kills 3 million people a year, you know, where, where are our air particulate levels the cleanest? Where it's green and yellow, where it's rich? And we consume the most energy, not in Saudi, it's red, but we consume the most energy, but we have regulatory regimes and can afford to clean up the local air and, the, and more than that, water and land. And where is the air the worst where it's poor? We visited in Nepal, you can see it's a bright red there, et cetera. So this is one of the great challenges and it's not completely intuitive. You wanna say, well, you know, environment and 
energy and we'll just cut out the use of these other forms of energy that are polluting. But in fact, energy allows us to build our economies and invest in the environment. So data must be used to tell the truth, not to call the action, no matter how noble the intentions. And if you haven't read Factfulness yet, read it. I found this line and buried in a paragraph deep near the end of the book, but I think it's, he's a medical doctor from Sweden. He passed now, but it's a remarkable quote, I think, tell the truth, but not to call to action, no matter how noble the intentions. Here's the world at night again, and, and I'm gonna wrap up with these thoughts that, that uh, when you look at the distribution of energy, green is oil, red is natural gas, and gray is coal. Blue is hydro, yellow, or the orange color is nuclear, and the yellow are renewables. This is the distribution of energy today in the world in major sectors. I'm gonna scale those proportional to demand, so now you can not just see where the lights are on, you can see why. Where the energy is consumed, the lights are on. In fact, the largest circle there on the right, the gray, half of that circle is coal, half of that pie chart is coal. That's not power fuels, that's total energy. Half the world lives in Southeast Asia, remember the map, four, close to four billion people. They get half their energy from coal. And we, and we feature that in another episode on Vietnam and China and other things. So that's the reality. Now, if we, if we remove 85% of that energy from the mix, I just did it, you can see what's left. And you gotta ask yourself, is the Middle East, is Africa, so South America, Russia, Southeast Asia, uh, what would they do if you did that? You know, they, in fact, more of their energy comes from fossil fuels even than Europe and the United States. What would happen? And, and, and there's policies to do that and their intentions are good, kind of the in energy directly to the environment, but it kind of naively leaves out the whole economic component of that. So, you know, you remove 86% of the world's energy and the lights go off, essentially. I just darkened the lights by 86% on this screen and, and I'd rather keep them on. Uh, you know, what are, the, what are the benefits of energy? You've seen some, you see them in switch on, hunger, clothing, shelter, clean water. These are the obvious things that happen when you lift yourself from poverty, but education, lights at night, kids reading, healthcare. If you haven't seen the drama film, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, watch it, wonderful, based on a true story in Africa. But more than that, rights and empowerment of women. Women are going for the water, they're cooking indoors, it's not the men. Men go exclusively to schools at times and not the women. So there's a proportional disadvantage to, to women with lack of energy than men. Immigration and migration, you know, where is the migration happen, happening? Where are we leaving? Where are we going towards a way, towards some kind of hope? Uh, if you look at, I, in longer talks, I talk about uh, the autocracies that exist in the world still today, uh, held mostly by men, strong men, uh, it turns out, and, and, and the burdens they put on their people. Uh, you, if you dig deep into that Kibra story, one could argue they don't necessarily want, uh, intentions are good, but don't necessarily want to see a fully educated public. Education leads to critical thinking, voting, democracies, and other kinds of things that tend to take autocrats out of power. So it's a, it's a non-trivial story, social, legal, political systems, as I showed at the beginning. Population growth, what do I mean by that with energy? Well, there's a direct strong correlation between fertility rate, and that's not how, that's the number of live births that, from a woman. It's not whether or not you're fertile. Some people have confused that. Fertility rate, number of live births are much higher where education is low, okay? As you start to add schooling, you see it in developed nations. This is a really strong correlation. Uh, as you start to add education, birth rates, uh, fertility rates go down by almost half. Okay, it begins to address some of the major challenges of population. Environmental investment, the ability to invest in the environment from energy and energy wealth. And then the adaptation to climate, uh, certainly the, the, the procedures and, and approaches today, I didn't get to talk about the U.S. success in this area, reducing our own emissions by 700 million tons since 2005 in the various ways we've done that. But that's real, you know. Now, not everybody, it, it's not gonna be fast enough, more than likely, I think most people agree it's tough to get to those numbers, so we adapt. And how do we allow people who ha don't have much to adapt? We gotta lift them up, 
access to energy, beginning to get some of the modern conveniences that the, the rich nations, the rich nations enjoy, like us sitting here on Zoom, air conditioned homes, communicating. It's I can work from home because I'm rich and I have electronics. Most people in the world do not have that advantage. So you bring all this stuff together and it changes the world. You know, it, it really begins to affect so many things. And I think that's what all of us are interested in doing. This not-for-profit that I form called the Switch Energy Alliance is keen on nonpartisan energy education through video-based most. And I'd encourage you to go there if you haven't seen that film or Switch and look at some of the short format stuff. Heavily used in, in middle schools, high schools, and universities around the world and still growing. So I'm going to leave it with that. I will uh, kind of open it up now to any questions or discussions you'd like to have. I think we've got a few minutes left. So Scott, we have Mark Schuster has a question in the group chat here. Sure. Uh, he, he says, the Kenyan story is fascinating with huge challenges. What do you see as the Kenyan's, Kenyan government's role in the solution? Yeah, Kenya Power is a, is a Kenya government um, company, if you will, or institution. And so they have a strong role to play. I think the fact, Mark, that they brought electricity to begin and took that challenge of trying to get in the radical middle, you know, co-op the, the cartels, provide safer electricity at an affordable price. And the cool part about tokens and phone credit is it starts to establish credit. So you're buying things in, in a sense, you have to prepay there, but phone also starts giving you an approach toward credit. So I think the government did some terrific things there. Um, I th I'm not quite sure uh, yet still, uh, who was who? <laughs> who was cartel? Who had been co-opted from the cartel to work on these things? Uh, if Kenya Power came back and took down all the illegal connections and put them back in, illegal, would the cartel remove them again and you just get in an endless loop? I think some of that was going on because the cartel had been educated on how to go up and down the power pole. So uh, it's not so simple. Uh, the government as a whole, though, I think federally, just like here, has a role to play in infrastructure. So facilitating infrastructure, whether it's highway systems, access to energy, um, you know, other kinds of, of educational centrally uh, provided things is, is vital. That comes through a tax base. Governments don't grow money. They tax the citizens for that, and then they provide those facilities back, and that lifts, that rising tide lifts all ships, just like it does in, in, in modern and wealthy economies. But it takes time, and even rich countries aren't without our, <laughs> our own cartels and our own corruption. One of the greatest inhibitors to solving and addressing energy poverty is corruption. We showed it in Kenya. You see it in every country you visited. The dam, if you watched the film in Ethiopia that showed the picture of, that was a sole source bid. It went to an Italian dam builder. A multi-billion dollar project without any competitive bidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little graft going on there, more than likely. But again, it's providing electricity. So we are always having to get our heads around this thought of, oh gosh, first, what's the good coming out of this? And, and that's, uh, that's never, it's always gray. Let me just leave it at that. Other questions? Linda McCall asked, uh, how difficult is it to present the facts without getting to policy advice? Yeah, <laughs> well, well uh, I have my biases and my opinions and, and I like to think some of them are educated, some of them aren't. Uh, but we, the way we try to stay nonpartisan at Switch is we, we have a lot of bantering between ourselves and we're all kind of politically different. We also have our stuff peer reviewed scientifically and technically, films. So I actually get top folks, energy people, and Harry does too in various areas to peer review us so factually we're sound. And then we try to look at multiple sides to each of these stories. So the critical thinking piece, pros and cons, goods and bads, you know, it takes time a little bit and, and to condense it takes a lot of time. If I had more time, I would have said less, written less. That's very true in filmmaking. Always, always. We shot over 500 hours to make this 79 minute film and the episodes are adding some to that. So you're always making decisions, the editors are, et cetera. But 
it's so important to do that. And again, data should be used to tell the truth, uh, not to try to coerce. Um, I worry. I worry in Western Europe and the United States now more than anywhere that we're using data to coerce. And in fact, the good and bad, you know, clean and dirty stories that are being told, they're just not real. Um, they're, they're uh, to oversimplify is to underestimate. And, and it's, it's a very real challenge that I think we all face is to make sure we try to understand a little bit more about that radical middle and the different components. Nobody's out to pollute the environment. I've never met anybody that goes out in the morning to attempt to do that as their daily joy. Okay, on the other hand, there, we all expect things and we, and we have them in wealthy nations. And I can say firsthand that everywhere I've visited, they want to enjoy some of those benefits as well. And they should be able to do that. <clears throat> the first thing somebody gets when they get a little electricity, the very first thing almost every time is a cell phone not what you would think, a cell phone. And the, the communication lines are open and everybody now is aware of what the world looks like, okay? Except maybe North Korea, which is still dark. It looks like an empty ocean. In fact, it's on a peninsula. There's just no electricity there, okay? So there are a few parts of the world that aren't open to outside input, but most are now. What Scott, we have, we have two more questions. Uh, one is asking who pays for the Ethiopian dam? And the uh, second is what is the most important actions individuals or companies can do to address the energy poverty? Sure. Ethiopian dam, uh, interestingly, was paid for mostly by Ethiopians. So if you've watched Switch On, you'll hear that piece of the story is the Ethiopian government and its people, the people of Ethiopia volunteered one month of salary each year to pay for that. Not at first, they weren't that happy, but then the competition started because Cairo, Egypt threatened to bomb it because it's on the Nile that flows to, to Egypt and Egypt was promised the Nile by colonial law a hundred years ago. And Ethiopia said, yeah, maybe, but it's kind of a river in our country too. So, so this balance of power was going on and now they're all at the table talking and the Ethiopian people said a month a year, it's remarkable, as bonds, hopefully someday to be paid back, but it's paid for internally. Not so most places in the world. There's a tremendous amount, and the data are very clear, of money from China, the Belt and Road uh, policy, I guess it is, to invest heavily in infrastructure around the world, uh, loan money heavily around the world, and even citizenship growing. The 65 countries I've been in, China is present in most of them doing the very things I just described. So it's different from the colonialization that went on through centuries and millennia. It's peaceful so far, but it's happening. And a lot of money is coming from China to buy up resources and, and put in infrastructure to, to help, but also to control. So let's not be naive about that. That's gone on in major global economies throughout human history, and it's continuing today. What can an individual do? Um, watch this film. If you haven't watched it yet, you know, ask yourself why I do. <laughs> you know, watch the film uh, on energy poverty and then share it. Share it with all your social networks, your companies, your schools. The only way good media get out is by word of mouth. You know, we, we won't go viral because we're not saying anything that's sort of flamboyant or dramatic, even though usually untrue or largely untrue. Those go viral. Million, five million in a day. Have you seen this? Yeah, but it's not true. So the only way these things happen is for you to start pushing them out. That's one thing I would say. And then start to get educated. You know, challenge yourself. I try to read media all over the board for my own biases. I read, you know, a couple big articles this morning on another topic that we're all fascinated by, and medium one, and one was in the Atlantic, and you know, I, I just try to digest things that challenge me and my thinking and then bring that together. So you have to begin to do that in the energy environment, economy, sphere, a little more educated. And then the last thing I would say you could do is on our website at Switch, I've put all my slides, literally 20 packs of slides organized by topic and I recorded an MP4 voice under them so you could hear what I would say. They're all there with references for the data you can build your own talks, use them in your own talks, 
and get out and start to speak to schools and, and uh, scout troops and civic groups and, and educate. You know, if you don't do it, others, I promise you are, and it's with their own particular take and spin, often to coerce. And I think it's m so important that we begin to speak uh, critically about these major topics so that our presidential candidates can't go off in these wacky areas, whether it's drill baby drill or the Green New Deal, which isn't green or new or a deal. Okay, so these things happen and we all want to believe them if they agree with us and our politics, but we've gotta become a little bit more uh, deeply thinking about these and that's what you can do. And then, you know, if you really wanna get out and see some of this, there are lots of groups around the world that look for intelligent, committed volunteers to go do an install, you know, participate in a village, water things, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of ways you can immerse yourself actually in the environment, if that's of interest to you. Hey, thanks for listening today. Um, look forward to the summer seminar. I really appreciate uh, Jana Evan and, and Aaron and others making it happen, Mark Blunt. Again, I wanna wish y'all a good weekend and I hope you enjoyed our first seminar of the summer.